here we go. This is going to be episode number seven of the Beginner to Master Speedrun. Uh, hopefully you know the drill by now, but in this series, I started at a 400 ELO, and I'm trying to work my way up as high as possible, hopefully share a lot of lessons along the way. Um, I'm hoping that today I'll be able to break 700, currently at 695. And as I get higher in ELO, my opponents will be getting stronger. So gradually we'll see some higher level concepts. And uh, let's waste no more time. Let's hop into the first game. Okay, playing few cat. I'm white, we'll start with E4. And let's see what my opponent would like to do. Uh, D6, this is a Pierce defense. Um, not the most common opening. I don't think I've encountered the Pierce in any game so far in the speedrun, but it's very playable, very solid. Black is now attacking the pawn on e4. And the reason why Black started with d6 is now I can't really effectively play e5 because after takes, takes, Black could trade queens and take away my casting rights. Um, so the most solid move here is knight c3, very simply developing, defending, controlling the center, and now c6. So I think this is called the check pierce, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, it is a way to play for black. I'm just going to focus on normal development. Uh, this is kind of the quintessential setup to, to play in the first four moves. Um, but now black is being very aggressive, very sneaky, moving the queen to pin my knight. So black is actually threatening to take the pawn on e4 next move. And there's a couple ways to deal with this. Uh, there's bishop d3 or bishop 2 d2. I'm going to play bishop d3 simply because I want to castle next move. Even though bishop d2 would align with the queen, um, I think the bishop is going to be better placed on g5, f4, e3. And now black did waste time moving the queen a couple times. But uh, e5, this is perfectly fine move. Uh, I can't win a pawn because even though I have two attackers, there are two defenders with the queen and the pawn. So now it's a question what to do with this tension. I mean, I could leave my pawn here and if takes, I take back with the knight. I could take on e5, but then after it takes, it does open up the bishop for black. And then pushing is another option, but... Um, not super fond of that. I think I just want to complete development. Bishop g5. Because there's some idea of taking to give black double pawns. And meanwhile, yeah, the center is very well defended. I have all the minor pieces developed. And a common theme that we've seen with a lot of these games um, throughout the series is my opponents being a little bit slow to complete development, especially of their minor pieces early in the game. Um, in this case, it might be hard to punish like right away just because black is so solid. So I'm going to keep improving. Queen d2, officially connecting the rooks. And yeah, black castles. And again, if I take, then take, don't think it really accomplishes much. Um, moves like rook d1 or rook e1, I think, are are very natural, just to get the rooks more centralized. There is a move here that I'm inclined to play, and sometimes a good thought process in positions like this, where it's still kind of late opening, early middle game, is to ask yourself, what does the opponent want to do? And of course, black wants to complete development of the queen side. I think one move that black would like to play is bishop to g4. So I'm going to play a uh, prophylactic move, like simply preventing bishop g4 with pawn h3. And even though this is sometimes not the most useful, I think it's it's a little bit annoying now for black to not be able to bring the bishop here. And if bishop to e6, then maybe, maybe at some point I can get in d5. Although bishop e6, d5, uh, there are a, a few too many black things covering the square. So... Yeah, I think now I'd rather just put the rook on d1. And yeah, I didn't want the, the bishop to be pinning my knight to the rook in, uh, in cases where I didn't play h3. 
So we see knight d7, so black has now developed all of their minor pieces. And yeah, this is interesting because the bishop can no longer retreat. And I do want to calculate this move d5 because it is pretty forcing. This knight in some, in some sense is pinned to the bishop. So if, we, if I imagine pawn d5, black would take with a pawn, I would take back. And then the bishop or knight can take. If the knight takes, I would take, black would take, and in the very end, I win the bishop. There's also bishop h7 in the very end to have the discovered attack against d5. So let's look at this one more time. d5, take, take. We just saw, I was just calculating knight takes. So if bishop takes, it is a little bit different. Let's imagine bishop take, knight take, knight take. And I don't have bishop takes e7 because the knight can recapture. But in that line, I do have bishop takes h7. And this might be one of the most like complex lines I've calculated throughout the series. I'm pretty sure it's not bad for white. I'm not sure how good it is, but at the very least, we'll be trading. And black is going to have to be very careful not to like lose a piece in these variations. So yeah, even though there's two defenders and three attackers, I'm kind of relying on the fact that I'm going to have pressure with the d-file, some eventual tactic with bishop takes h7, or the eventual like bishop takes e7. I do see bishop takes d5. I think this is the best approach for black. And now I'm debating, does it matter if I take on h7 first? Probably want to take on d5 first. And I did just lose a pawn in, on all these trades, but the whole point is I'm going to win it back with bishop takes h7. And again, if I take on e7, knight takes back, and. I'm not winning anything there. So let's take on h7. Yeah, that was basically a very fancy trade. Now I'll take the knight. But the position has transformed a ton. I mean, so many pieces have been traded off. Black going haywire with the king, king g6. Uh, I was just expecting king g8, but as king being adventurous, I could take on d6 and then take, take. I lose a knight, I win the knight back. It's not a bad option. The other idea is to try and like just checkmate the king somehow, maybe like f4. But f4 does allow the queen trade. Maybe h4? Yeah, I was hoping to like get an f4, but after queen c5, then I'm in check. We would trade queens. I'm going to play h4. Queen takes d6 was also, I think, completely fine in that position. Um, but because of the time situation, I'd rather try and win the game quicker. There's also a principle when the opponent's king is less safe, you want to keep queens on the board. Uh, so now I move like queen d3 or queen e4. I'm going to play queen d3 check. It is retreating, but in the event of king h6, I'm already mating. Probably also with king h5, queen h7. So we see f5. And now, as I should note, I do have the fork if I want it. There's also queen g3. I feel like I'm spoiled for choice here, but I do have to move a bit quicker. I'm going to go for the fork, I'll just win material. Um, queen and rook are now attacked, and d6 is also probably going to be falling at some point. Not to mention, I do have ideas of queen g3, which might even be stronger than taking the rook. Yeah, because if the king moves this way, I'm mating. King moves this way. 
I think my knight is more powerful than the rook. Even though I can take and win material, I'd rather start by taking the pawn. Because the knight is such a good attacking piece. And I am threatening queen takes g7 now, still threatening the rook. I think black is going to have to defend. Like rook g8 is probably the best try here. Okay, we see king e8. And again, I could take the rook, but I'd really like to keep my knight on the board. There's queen g6, there's queen takes g7. There's knight takes g7. A little bit spoiled for choice. I'm going to play knight takes g7. Winning the pawn with check. And a move like rook d1 looks really nice. Simply doubling up and yeah, maybe I had something better there, but I'm getting all my pieces involved. Well, Black's not giving up. Okay, so now, I mean, I could take the knight, I could take the rook and then take the pawn. At this point, it's probably just a matter of simplifying. I think I'm inclined to take the knight. And after queen takes, I could start with queen takes e5 and then just take the queen the next move. Like the queen's still hanging, the king's attacked. If queen e6, I'll play knight takes e6. I will say this is probably the highest level game I've played so far. Like it's required a lot of uh, a lot of calculations in various moments. Um, but now it's a matter of cleanup clean up time, um, taking the pawn, queen d6 coming. Yeah, let's push the pawn. Important to note, I did make Luft. Uh, if my pawn were still on h2, black would be mating, but that's not the case. And the most efficient way here is to make another queen. Uh, or... Yeah, this position is actually checkmate in two. Let's uh, let's go for queen d6, and then knight e7 will be checkmate. Okay, tried to be efficient there. A uh, very interesting game. I think my opponent was playing more of a system-based opening. Yeah, this is a the check pierce. I think maybe more often. Black will play queen c7 or knight d7 right away to prepare e5. So black lost a little bit of time in the opening. But then things got very spicy when I played this move d5. But um, sometimes when your pieces are like developed and on good squares like this, then it should be your goal to open the position just because many times the tactics will favor the side with the, the better placed pieces. And we saw how the position transformed. Even though I didn't win any material right away, my opponent got a little bit feisty with the king. I guess I was winning the pawn, though, in, in this variation. I think in this position, it's not easy for black to find a move to like, keep this defended. Like, maybe knight f6, maybe pawn f6, but it wasn't pretty. And then, yeah, then it was a matter of attacking. I imagine maybe there is a, a better way to win, maybe a force mate, but that was a fun game. Uh, let's move on to another one. I've officially broken 700. So we'll do a new 10 minute game. Playing Chess Ninja 24. And I'm gonna stick with the classical opening repertoire, King's Pawn opening. And we have a Spanish. The Spanish opening, I like to play the most common variation, which is pawn a6. This gives white the chance to go into the exchange variation. Now there is a small trap here. If white takes a pawn, which we do see, um, it's not supposed to be that great for white. Even though I'm not going to be winning material, I'm going to be winning back the pawn with this move queen d4. I think I may have shown this in like one of the previous episodes. Uh, it's very good to know if you play the king's pawn opening. So inevitably, you'll encounter the Roy Lopez or the Spanish. And um, I don't think I've ever seen this move, Queen h5, before. 
Very clever though, defending the knight and threatening f7. Now, I don't have to defend f7 right away because I can regain the pawn and check the king. I think I'd like to do that. Got my opponent going straight for the kill. Now, White has three legal moves here, king f1, king d1, and queen e2. I think king d1 is the most interesting because it sets up rook e1. And then I would have to be very careful in that case. We see queen e2. Um, and now, yeah, I don't think I want to take on g2 because then I'm subjecting myself to some discoveries. So I think it's simplest here just to trade queens. And we're entering a position where it's equal material. I might as well develop and attack the knight. But even though it is equal material, there's a few imbalances. And one of the imbalances that's in my favor is I have the two bishops against bishop and knight. And in a relatively open position like this, uh, usually the two bishops are just a bit more valuable. We'll start with bishop f5. So with both developing bishop moves, I'm attacking something that's undefended. This case attacking c2. And at some point I would like to castle, but my king is tied down to defending f7. So if we see a move like c3 here, and there's not too many ways for white to defend the pawn or king d2, um, I was thinking I would play f6 just to get the knight away and then look to castle. I could also take, like take, take, and castle with check is nice, at least nice looking. But I think I'd rather keep this bishop for later. Like I don't want to trade it off so soon. And white's going to have to spend time now moving the knight. Imagine we'll see maybe knight f3, maybe knight c4. Okay, so white, yeah, white might be able to trade this bishop off anyway. I was initially thinking bishop f4 check. I'm not sure how much I'm achieving there. Although there is a very interesting variation. I think I'll start with bishop f4. Now white has to choose where to put the king. King e1 would lose a bishop. Imagine we'll see either king d1 or king c3. And the interesting variation I was looking at was if king d1, I was thinking about castling, sat my bishop, and then win something back with a triple fork with a rook. Um, that's not quite happening here. And now our bishops are having a staring contest. My bishop's not defended, so I probably have to take. There is a move knight e7, which is kind of clever, allowing bishop takes bishop, and then I have the fork on d5, and then win the bishop back. I could also retreat this way, but I feel like that would be a loss of time. Yeah, let's go ahead and take, because then the rook is going to have to take, and I can continue completing development like as we head into the endgame. Ooh, opponent throws in the check, what we call an in-between move, or Zwischenzug, not recapturing right away. Uh, I think this only helps me, though, because after 97, I basically get in this move for free, and <laughs> White's going to have to win back the piece. So that was a nice free tempo. I could start with knight d5. I think I'd rather castle first, just to apply pressure to the pawn. And I'm giving white the chance to play knight d2, after which then knight d5 would force the king to b3. The king would not be able to retreat there. And meanwhile, if king d2 right away, preparing knight c3, then I can take the pawn with check. So it's a little bit awkward for white to develop. Like The king is very awkward on c3. 
Usually it's a pawn that likes to be on c3, creating the pawn chain. Got my apple cider. Tis the season of, of apple cider. <laughs> Happy autumn. So, yeah, I'm curious what white's going to do here. It feels like a lot of moves are, are losing something. Like any king move would lose a pawn. Okay, we see rook e1. I could start with knight d5, but knight d5, king d2, and then I can't win the pawn. So I'm going to keep my knight here. I'm going to play rook to e8. Being very patient, trying to optimize everything else before I, I pounce with knight d5. And this rook is undefended on e1, so knight d5 attacks the king and the rook, and king d2 would defend. But yeah, maybe I'm setting up some forcing combination. Okay, we see knight a3. Which is not the move I was expecting. This knight doesn't seem to have a great future. This is what we call superfluous knights, where the knights defend each other. And in this case, they're a little bit awkward because, yeah, this knight doesn't really have any good squares. So b5 comes to mind as a way to push white back, maybe set up b4 in some cases. But if I play b5, knight e3, not sure if I'm achieving much because then the knight would hit the bishop. Another idea is to throw in the check and then play knight f4, which would attack the d-pawn and the g-pawn. I think I like that a bit better. Knight d5. King b3. Okay, I was not expecting that. Now, and there's a really funny idea that comes to mind, is to play b5, and then if knight e3, I, I can play a5 threatening a4 checkmate. White throws in this move. And here it's important to note, I don't have to recapture right away, I can take the knight with check. And this wins a piece. Another example of an in-between move, or a Zwischenzug, however you pronounce it. I'm sure there's Germans watching that. Uh, might criticize my pronunciation there. But, okay, got the in-between move. One material. White's king is, is being feisty. Like, both games so far, <laughs> my opponent's kings are, are uh, being very adventurous. I mean, white is threatening to take the pawn. But do I mind? I'm look, looking for ways to set up some, like, mating that. I think I'll start with king d7 and just defend. Yeah, it feels very close to checkmate, especially after c4. Like, the king has no legal moves now. And if we imagine my knight can get to d3, that would be checkmate. So, okay, so I'm threatening maiden in one. Opponent saw I was also threatening the pawn, but okay. Uh, I didn't even realize I was attacking g2. So, funny finish. Um, it's funny, in the previous episode of the speedrun, almost all my opponents were bringing out their queen early. But this episode, my opponents are bringing out the king early. And I think that was pretty smooth overall. I did want to show, just in the opening, uh, usually an exchange variation... Yeah, white should not take the pawn, either castling or d4. I think they're, they're the two main moves. But after this, it's known to be good for white, or for, for black, I should say, because uh, white loses time having to deal with these things. I think most players play knight of three, allowing this, and this would go into a similar position to what we got in the game. Um, and then, yeah, what my opponent played was uh, was interesting. 
And I thought king d1 would be an interesting try to really exploit my e-file. Uh, my plan was, if white went for this, I was going to play bishop to e6, preparing to castle, defending the pawn. I think this should be okay, like even if rook e1, uh, probably queen digs g2, maybe queen d5 to be safe to pin the knight. So yeah, going back to what happened in the game, I think all of this was uh, was nice. And then, yeah, I didn't do anything too special. I just got my pieces to nice centralized squares. White's pieces got awkward. And then, yeah, this was um, this is a moment I, I won material. Um, I didn't want to show if my opponent played knight e3. I was going to play, I was thinking about playing a5 and saying, oh no, my bishop, and then checkmate. And this is a funny mating idea. So anyway, fun game. Hopefully some lessons to take away. Uh, let's do one more. Playing Davud, 70. This might be the highest rated opponent I've played thus far. Don't think I've played anyone over the rating of 800. Okay, we see bishop c4. Uh, this is called the bishop's opening. I'm going to play knight to c6. I wonder if we're going to see a attempted, yeah, we do, attempted scholar's mate. So in the previous episode, we saw a few games with the early queen h5. Uh, in this case, yeah, it's just a matter of not getting mated, block the early attack. And now g4. I've seen this before. Uh, this is a very aggressive way of just trying to win the game very quickly. White wants to play this, force my knight to move, and then still checkmate on f7. So there are a few ways to deal with this. Um, if I want to be super safe, I could play queen e7 just to make sure the pawn's defended, even a move like h6 to prevent against g5. Um, but here, because white's not threatening anything immediately, I have the move knight to d4, and this is the beginning of my uh, my counterplay. Not only hitting the queen, but also hitting the pawn on c2. And yeah, white, white doesn't have too many options to defend the queen and the pawn, but this is one of them. And with this move, yeah, again, in the previous episode, I showed a tactic where I played bishop b4, provoked the queen to take, and then fork. In this case, if I play bishop b4, it's not forcing. Like, white doesn't have to take. And white can play queen d3 and keep everything defended. I think if bishop b4, queen d3, then white might be doing OK, because c3 is then a threat to fork my pieces. So I think I'm much better off probably just taking the pawn. It's a free center pawn. Could also take the g-pawn. Um, kind of spoiled for choice here. I'll take the e4 pawn. And yeah, I'm attacking the queen again. I'm also setting up pawn d5. So if white moves a queen like to d3, which I think is the only safe square to keep c2 defended, I can then play d5 defending and attacking. Yeah, we can see how quickly such an opening can backfire. Like white was trying to win in four moves, uh, but now the position is very, very grim. And with d5, I'm also unleashing my bishop to attack the undefended pawn on g4. Here, yeah, very simply c6. I could have taken, but then queen takes. I'd rather keep my knight in the center. And yeah, I think here, bishop takes g4 looks nice. And this is a situation, there's a lot of nice looking moves, like b5, bishop c5. Uh, with bishop g4, I should acknowledge that white has a move f3 to fork. But the drawback of f3 is it exposes a king and allows queen h4 check. So I wouldn't mind if white plays this move. And the goal going forward is it's probably still to go for queen h4. Have to give white a taste of their own medicine. Um, now it's uh, very justified bringing out the queen to try and finish off the game. 
Um, yeah, I think the simplest approach is 9F2. This is a triple fork. I think some people call this royal fork. White has one legal move, move the king back to the starting square. And then I'll take the queen with double check. The knight and my queen will be delivering check. Uh, we might see resignation here. We might see uh, checkmate next move. King f1, queen f2 checkmate. And if king d1, then queen e1 checkmate. Okay. Yeah, definitely no mercy that game. Uh, another example of how to punish someone who's trying to, to win quickly. Um, I know a lot of players do crumble against this g4 idea, especially at the, the lower levels, but it's really nothing to be scared of. And against opponents who go for this, uh, you should just look for ways to make sure everything's defended first of all, but then look for ways to get uh, an attack of your own. So um, let's do one more. With every episode I post, people are asking for longer episodes. So I think we're at game number four for this one. Play another King's Pawn. And here we have a more normal opening. We might see another Spanish, have an Italian. Uh, I'll play Bishop C5. With Bishop C5, I'm avoiding any like Knight G5 ideas. Um, yeah, because the queen would still control g5. And with d3, uh, this is very standard Italian. Here I'm happy to play knight f6 and just prepare it to castle. And if white goes for knight g5 in this case, I don't mind castling. I think it was, what, episode 3? Maybe episode 2 or 3 where we saw my opponents uh, basically go for this trade on f7 which it looks scary. Like if takes, 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 I lose a rook and a pawn, my king gets a bit more exposed. Uh, but that variation is actually very good for black because the two minor pieces are much more valuable than rook and pawn. So my opponent's not going for the media trade. Um, I could play h6 and kick the knight away, maybe provoke it to trade. I think I'd rather just play d6. Just open up my bishop. And white has some options here. Uh, we might see castling. We might see the bishop develop. Bishop e3. Okay, so challenging my bishop. There's a few ways to deal with this. Uh, for one, I, of course, could take. Which, like, the more I'm looking at, the more I like it. Uh, there's other moves too. There's h6. There is, uh, there's like bishop b6 if I want to just drop back and be solid. But I'm looking at the idea of taking. And then after white takes, I have the move knight g4, which seems a little bit over ambitious. But I do attack the knight and the pawn, both of which are undefended. In that variation, I think I'll go for it. Trying to take advantage of the fact that white, I mean, white has multiple targets. My king is castled, white's king is not castled. And I'm essentially trying to seize initiative before white can complete development. Um, now, when I took on e3 after this trade, the f file becomes half open for white. So I just have to be extra careful of ideas of like rook f1 and queen f3. Uh, but those moves didn't really work. And this move doesn't really work either because the knight is just hanging. Um, I probably don't want to take on e3. Even though taking on e3 would be a triple fork. Um, whenever you consider a move like this, you have to ask yourself, what does opponent want to do in response? And then I think queen h5 would be very difficult to deal with in that case. So let's take the knight. My opponent just um, just didn't realize the knight was attacked. And the nice thing here is I have two attackers against e3. There's no defenders. So I'm pretty much guaranteed to win this pawn next move. I really don't see how white can save it. 
And there's a move d5 to counterattack, but even then I can take with check or take and attack the queen. Okay, white has triple isolated e pawns. And now it's a choice. Uh, do I take the e3 pawn with the queen, with the knight? I can also take on e5 with this knight. I really feel spoiled for choice. I think I'll take on e3 with the knight. Hitting the queen. I mean, there's so many targets. Next move I can take if I want. I can also maybe look to take on g2 with check and just go straight for the attack against white's king. I'm expecting the queen to move. And the queen has e2 and d3 to defend the bishop. I was going to say, if, if queen d3, knight takes e5 would be a fork. But here, yeah, queen e2, I think I might as well just take with check. And white is most likely not going to be casting this game. Unless white wants to sack the queen and then castle, but wouldn't mind there. So probably we'll see king f2 or king f1. The drawback of king f1 is then I have another check. I also have bishop h3 in, in some cases. I get another piece involved. I mean, with the white king so exposed like this, the strategy is to try and get more pieces into play. Like, my knight and queen are doing a nice job, but it would be very nice to get, especially my minor pieces, on the queen side towards the king side. So, yeah, I like this move, bishop h3. Just aligning with the king, defending the knight, setting up discoveries. Uh, I am threatening knight to f4 check to attack the king and the queen. I feel like I'm also close to creating some sort of mating net. Okay, king f2. Yeah, it feels very close to mating somehow, like queen f4, queen h4. I think in both those cases, the king is going to try and hide on g1. So I'm just going to take on e5 first. And I'm keeping these options open. I'm also creating the option of knight g4 check. And with two knights, the bishop and the queen, like all swarming around, reminds me of one of those uh, like movie scenes where you're you're stuck in the ocean and the sharks are are ready to have a nice meal. Okay, so knight, wait a minute, knight g four. It's important in this position to just consider the various options because there's also queen f4 or queen h4, and there's no more king g1. So actually, I, I think queen f4 and queen h4 are both made in two. I'll play queen h4, so I think the more aesthetic made in two. White's only legal move is king f1, and then knight e3 will be double check and mate. So knight and bishop attack the king, there's no way to block or capture. So that was a pleasant finish. Uh, another case where my opponent, in some sense, disobeyed some opening principles, uh, didn't really see this threat. But even if white saw like both threats here, I think it's already tricky for white to deal with it. Of course, white should save the knight. Maybe here the best option is to trade on, on f7, uh, because if knight f3, I'm happy to take and then win a clean pawn, trade on c4. So anyway, another fun, hopefully instructive game. Hope you guys enjoyed this episode. If you have questions or comments, leave them below. If you like the content, hit subscribe, like. It does help the channel grow. And I'll see you guys in the next episode. Stay tuned.